um, as you know, it's a famous casino in, in Monaco. And um, um, since in particle physics, you, uh, essentially all simulation, all almost all relevant simulation is Monte Carlo simulation. That's what we are going to really talk about today. So in brief outline, we'll start with uh, what simulation is and what um, what is Monte Carlo simulation. Then we'll talk a little bit about, uh, well, I'll tell you a short story of a CERN experiment um, to give you a, an idea about what, what I say when I say detector or trigger or various uh, jargon words like that. Then uh, we'll have a brief introduction to event generators, which will be followed by um, what we do to simulate the detectors. Uh, there are two kinds of detector simulation. Uh, one of them is uh, what we call a full simulation with uh, Jan 4. And uh, the other one is fast simulation, uh, which is mostly used for feasibility studies and things like that. And finally, I conclude by a few uh, remarks and uh, giving you a, a short homework. So if we uh, think about what simulation is in general, uh, I looked at this dictionary.org and it says, to simulate is to model, replicate, duplicate the behavior, appearance, or properties of. So you can see there a mechanical uh, horse uh, that was used to train soldiers in World War I, the cavalry soldiers. So you put the guy on it, the, the, the machine works, and you get the horse simulation. Okay? Uh, and this kind of simulation is the simplest uh, and the most common uh, simulator in physics, engineering, etc. Uh, the, the, the idea, main idea behind this sort of simulator is that you put uh, some sort of physical or mathematical model uh, for each of the components of the object that you want to simulate. Okay. So if you are, for instance, trying to simulate an electrical circuit, you put, for instance, IV characteristics of your uh, transistors or your whatever resistors, capacitors, etc. Okay. And then uh, the computer puts all these little equations, well, these uh, formulas for each of these components together to get, get you uh, an equation, okay? And that equation is normally solved through some numerical recipe, like newton raphson method or whatever you have, what have you. Um, well, more traditional example than this uh, horse, of course, is spice. Uh, if you have ever taken any sort of circuit uh, lectures, uh, you must have encountered this, well, you must have encountered this, uh, this simulator. It's been around since 1973, and um, it, uh, it teaches you how not to burn your uh, computer, uh, electrical components when you go to the lab. But what about Monte Carlo simulation? Well, Monte Carlo simulation is a kind of simulation where instead of doing some sort of deterministic calculation, uh, you instead rely on repeated random statistical uh, techniques. So. Uh, you you take one thing, one, one well, you, you, let's say uh, you take a ne neutron and you want to calculate what the cross section is or how that neutron is going to behave within a hypothetical reactor that you are designing. Okay. So what you do is you take one neutron, you just give it a random direction and random speed, and then you just move it around in the uh, in the model of your of your proposed detector, uh, proposed reactor. Okay. So it moves around, you roll random numbers as it, as it moves, and every time it comes to a new piece of matter, you roll another number to see if it moved one direction or another direction, or, or, or if it penetrated, or it got slower, or it got faster, something like this. Okay? So, so you do this not for one case, but you do it for multiple cases, hundreds of thousands of neutrons you try in your proposed reactor, and then you eventually get uh, some sort of idea what would happen if you have many neutrons traveling inside uh, your uh, your proposed structure. Okay, so um, the name comes from well, was given by this guy Nick Metropolis. Um, he is one of the people who was working at Los Alamos uh, in the after 1945, uh, along with uh, people like Enrico Fermi, Stan Lam, and uh, John von Neumann. And um, uh, and the name comes from really this Monte Carlo casino because uh, supposedly Ulam's uncle uh, would borrow money from relatives to go to Monte Carlo, so somehow the name stuck. And um, uh, these are the people really who kind of invented modern Monte Carlo uh, techniques. 
On the right, you see an analog computer called a Fermiac, uh, invented by Enrico Fermi. Uh, it's a small mechanical device, uh, but you cannot really. Uh, oh. Let's see if I can show it like this. Probably those on the back cannot see the, the grid that is drawn on, the, <coughs> on this piece of paper. So you, you take a large piece of paper, you make a two-dimensional uh, graph of your proposed reactor here, okay? And then you send in, let's say, a neutron. Uh, a neutron, uh, th this machine has a piece here where you can put in a pen, okay? And uh, it has some uh, different roles. Uh, which can be adjusted depending on the, the properties of your neutr neutron. So, so this guy moves over this piece of paper and uh, makes scattering or whatever, uh, and then you can you can uh, essentially compute compute what your uh, reactor is going to respond to a given neutron. Okay. So, so this is the basic, very very simple Monte Carlo technique. You you get hundred guys, all of them with these things, and then you put them all on tables, and they move their neutrons around, and then you come as a physicist and say, aha, that design is probably the best one we have. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, in 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 particle physics, this is the way we do things. Whenever you when I, whenever you hear the word Monte Carlo or simulation, these are essentially synonymous nowadays. Okay, so um, let me give you an example of uh, how you do things with uh, Monte Carlo simulation. So the, the simplest, very basic example, uh, let's say 101 of Monte Carlo um, uh, techniques, is this numerical integration. So let's say you want to compute f, uh, the, the definite integral from 0 to 1 of a function f of x. Here is one such function, okay? And of course, the simplest way to numerically compute this is to divide this function into, well, this, the, the, the divide the area under this function into little re rectangles, okay, and then sum them up. So if I if I divide uh, this region from zero to one to n steps, okay, so um, the, the 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 width of this uh, rectangle is one over one over n, and the, the the height of the rectangle is the function computed at at each of these uh, points, okay. So this is very simple numerical method. Now the difficulty comes when you want to do this in d dimensions. So let's say again we have a hypercube, um, well running from zero to one in d dimensions, okay? And then you have this function and you are trying to integrate it. Well, you might say, well that's not a problem. I can do a very similar thing like this. Instead of like integrating the area under one function, I can integrate uh, the, the, the area. Uh, hyper area under this hyper curve. Okay, uh, but uh, one can one can easily show that um, uh, this is not. Uh, well, if, if you do this, of course, uh, the way you divide it, let's say uh, zero to one to n units in the one-dimensional case, you'll have to divide this zero to zero one hyper cube into <coughs> n to the power d uh, units. Uh, to, to, do, to, do, to, to do the integration, numerical integration in d dimensions, okay? And one can show without too much difficulty uh, that uh, the error uh, on your estimate uh, will be order of um, this n, which is n to the power d, uh, n to the power minus 2 over d. Well, this is not very viable. Why? Because, uh, first of all, this error scales uh, with n to the power minus 2 over d, and uh, this means that your error is dependent on how much, what dimensional object you are integrating. Okay? It's not easy to converge on such a numerical integration. Furthermore, um, you see, we need to do this computation n to the power d time. This is many, many times you have to compute this function f. Okay? So, so what you can do is you can do this. The, the, you can do the same thing, but instead you can choose um, randomly n points. Uh, from a uniform PDF, but uniform uh, uh, probability distribution function, probability density function, and then uh, you just compute uh, this sum 1 over n f of uh, xi. So you choose uh, n points randomly, and then you compute the function at those points, okay? And then you sum them up and take essentially the average, okay? And uh, one can easily show uh, that the error uh, for this estimate um, scales like 1 over square root of n independent of the dimension d. 
So whenever you want to move to multiple dimensions, um, uh, this is an excellent technique to, to do integration. So if what I told you so far didn't make much sense to you, let me give you a simple example. So let's say I wanted to compute this one-dimensional case uh, from 0 to 1 dx over square root of x. Okay? So um, you learned a little bit of root yesterday. Uh, one single experiment to do this, so, so one, way, one, one, one statistical measurement, Monte Carlo uh, measurement for this quantity is, is written in root like this. So uh, define as, uh, a, a, a variable s for sum, define number of experiment, no, number of times you want to, to, to repeat this, here for instance 10,000 times, okay? So then loop from uh, 0 to 10,000, <coughs> And then add to the sum 1 over square root of a random number, okay? Then you print out uh, what is uh, s over n, sum over n. So what is the average for um, uh, 1 over square root of x where x is randomly selected each time, okay? And then uh, here is the answer you get. Well, when you do this, of course, you're going to get slightly different answers. Since this is a Monte Carlo, it's based on random things. But uh, we get a number like 2.03. If you compute this uh, well, by hand, you will see the real answer, the correct answer is 2. So you get like a, a very close answer. Yes? Uh, what is the R and the M function, please? What does it return? Ah, uh, g, 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 this G random R and the M uh, returns a, a, a random number between 0 and 1. Uh, that has a uniform uh, distribution. <coughs> is this compatible with our problem? Uh, yes, because here you need to generate num numbers in a uniform manner. Is 0 to 1 compatible? Uh, yes, because your integration limits go from 0 to 1. Thank you. Mm -hmm. May I ask yes. If you run this again, will it give the exact the same result? Absolutely not. No. no. Every no, time you yes. <laughs> what? Okay. I mean, if you manage to initialize root seeds, uh, random number C, well, the generator with certain C, then you can get the same answer. But in general, no. You will just generate every time these 10,000 uh, random numbers that you generate will be different, of course, from one another. So the, the average of those will be different. And, yeah. So that random uh, RNDM function generates pseudo random numbers. Ah, yes, of course. I mean, in, 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 a, in a computer, there is no other way unless you for somehow manually given random numbers from the outside. What is pseudo random? Well, pseudo, pseudo random means not uh, well, not really random. Okay, some but uh, numbers that 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 uh, behave on certain characteristics like random numbers, but that that are generated actually in some sort of deterministic manner inside the computer. Anyway, um, actually, th th this question uh, is exactly what I wanted to talk about next. What is the error on our computation? So, if I tell you the integral is 2.03, would you be happy enough with this? Okay. And to, to understand this, I can do another Monte Carlo uh, study. I can say, I can repeat this procedure, let's say, uh, 5,000 times, okay? And in each case, I, com I, I get out the result, and put that result into a histogram, okay? And this is what I did, and here I actually give you the, the very short root macro to do this as well. I define a histogram, uh, I define number of experiments, I define uh, how many times, uh, how many iterations I want to do per experiment, etc. And then uh, here is the distribution I get. And this, from this distribution you can read that uh, uh, the the RMS of this distribution, so essentially how, how, how much there was fluctuation in these different repetitive uh, calculations such as this, okay, is uh, about 2.2% uh, of, the, of the real uh, value. So it's like, so, so you can say uh, this 2.03 uh, has an error on it of about 2.2%. Uh, What's the overflow? Yeah, sorry, overflow? Uh, well, overflow, there is no overflow up here, but... Uh, what? Ah, okay. Uh, in, in a histogram, uh, you define a range, right? The histogram, for instance, in this case, the histogram goes from 0 to 5. 
And uh, if there are any entries that came up below zero or above five, they will be written as under flow or overflow. Is the RMS is the same as the standard ABS of the distribution? Uh, yes, that is the same. Well, in, in this in this case, what root reports as RMS is is yes, it's the standard deviation of the distribution. Okay, so um, as you can see, this is a very powerful technique. Uh, you can do many, many things uh, with, with Monte Carlo. So now, having introduced uh, what we mean by Monte Carlo simulation, let me now introduce you a few of the concepts that we are going to use, the, the stuff that we are going to try to simulate. So here is the story of an experiment at CERN. Uh, this is the CERN 2 meter bubble chamber, which ran between 65 and 77. Uh, it had um, a, a source of um, a, keon, a, a keon beam source uh, at uh, 4.2 GeV, <coughs> and uh, it fit into this building, and it was uh, like a, a, a relatively small size uh, detector. Here you can see one man, and this is uh, well, compared to our modern detectors, of course, it's tiny. Okay, so uh, what is a detector? A detector is essentially a piece of um, metastable medium, okay? Uh, and metastable in the sense that even if you give a little bit of a push, it just uh, gives you some sort of signal. And uh, in this case, in this uh, bubble chamber experiments, this is, uh, for instance, uh, a super, uh, uh, how do you call this? Uh, super heated, no. Uh, okay, superheated uh, helium. So, so it is, let's say, a liquid helium, but right little bit above even the, 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 the boiling temperature. You just keep it that way by just putting proper pressure, etc. Okay, and then uh, or or hydrogen, uh, and then uh, you, you, your particles come. Let's say your kaons come as the uh, kaon is a charged particle. It it uh, interacts with uh, the molecules, uh, atoms of this uh, hydrogen, helium, whatever it was, hydrogen in this case. And, uh, and then small bubbles uh, happen. So uh, as, as the particle moves, it gives this, this tiny little bit of energy, which, which makes a local boiling of the, the, the liquid. Okay? And each of these boiled, uh, bubble, uh, boiled gas makes a little bubble. Okay? So at the end, uh, all charged particles appear as these uh, little bubbles on a, on, on, on our, uh, in our detector. So what you do is, of course, you first you need to have a, a, a camera, okay, uh, and that camera uh, has a shutter. So whenever there is some particle is coming, uh, you, it, you you press the the, uh, the shutter button, and then it makes a, a, a shot, okay, and then uh, you make many many shots, and among those you choose the most interesting ones, okay. So here's an interesting one. Here is something is coming, you see, it is interacting with some guy over here, so two new particles are coming out, okay? But interestingly enough, here you see two guys uh, moving in two different directions, okay, bending in two different ways, um, that seem to be coming from out of nowhere, okay? So what this means is probably there is some sort of neutral particle here that is not interacting with our medium, okay? So. Uh, at this interaction, actually, there are three particles that are uh, is coming out. One of them is neutral, it goes a little bit, and then it decays into two new charged particles. Okay. Well, of course, they are bent in different ways because we apply a magnetic field, uh, and so you can uh, measure the momenta and the charge. Okay. So this is uh, essentially your detector. Then what does it do? Your detector gives you these pictures, but uh, the pictures are not really understandable by a computer. So what you need to do is you need to convert this analog medium, okay, like this picture, into some sort of digital medium, which is, can be processed by a computer. So what you do is you take this uh, guy, you make a, a chart of it, and then you put, uh, well, you make measurements, and you, you, you punch those measurements into a card, and then you give the card to the computer, and the computer finds out where these empty spaces are that you punch, and then it uh, digitizes, so this way you digitize your photo, okay? So you record and digitize your data. After the digitization, now the computer can make com calculations for you. So it does what we call event reconstruction. So it takes all these points that you have, and then uh, it knows the magnetic field, and it can calculate what the, well, for, a, for an assumed mo uh, mass, 
uh, what the what the particles momentum was or or uh, what the charge is. It. Okay. So so this step, what we call for instance tracking, we track the points and we, we obtain uh, the, the the charge particles uh, trajectory or uh, putting different objects together with different pieces of information to reconstruct an electron, a muon or an, another object, okay, is called event reconstruction, okay. So there you go, in this event reconstruction, when you have a, this slide on your computer, you can go and see uh, what were the individual particles in that particular event, okay. So then the last step is of course uh, using root. Of course there is no root at that time, there is not even Pau, I think, maybe. Uh, so, so what you do, you need to make histograms, and you write a program that makes histograms for you, and then prints them on this uh, dot uh, matrix form, uh, printer. Okay. So here is the the, the, the hard drive of your uh, experiment. Okay. Uh, oh, and and uh, your analysis uh, takes these reconstructed objects together and puts them together and tries to see if there are any peaks uh, in the distribution. Okay. So there you go. Here is uh, what we are going to simulate. So in, in short summary of this story, uh, in, in real life what you do is you have a machine which produces events for you, okay, it makes collisions like LAC, okay, and then uh, these events happen inside the detector and this detector uh, is, uh, uh, is some sort of metastable thing, it, it, it gets excited, whatever, and then uh, it makes some signals, those signals are read by your data acquisition <coughs> uh, system. And, uh, and of course, data acquisition system uh, nowadays automatically uh, well, part of your design it digitizes the, the analog signals from the detector. Okay. So then uh, you you go to event reconstruction. You whatever you use uh, CMS software, antenna or whatever you want, you have to reconstruct your electrons, muons, jets, uh, etc. And then you do your physics analysis, and uh, this is what you do for, for when you get real data. This is exactly what we need to, to simulate. Um, so, so in this virtual reality, what we are going to do is, first of all, we, need, we will need to generate events. Instead of AAC, someone else needs to generate those events. And then instead of Atlas CMS uh, or whatever detector you have, we will have uh, some sort of detector simulation to uh, simulate the effects of this system, okay? Plus, uh, digi uh, 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 some other piece of simulation or some software which will digitize the output from this uh, detector simulation. And then we can feed, so, so the, the output uh, format of this, this chain will be exactly in the same format that comes from the detector, so you can do the rest uh, your, well, through the same software, through your event reconstruction software and your physics analysis software. Okay? So there is also a quick and dirty way which I'll come back later on. So let's have a look at this step one event generation. Um, uh, we start uh, in with two protons, let's say, which are coming together, and uh, they are going to collide. When they are going to collide, of course, the main interaction will be going will, will, will be mainly between two uh, partons, um, this, this hard scatter case, okay, which you would normally calculate through matrix elements. And then, uh, if you have things like Ws and Z bosons, things like that, those guys decay. And then, uh, all of this picture, of course, needs to have initial and final state radiation coming out, uh, Q QED or QCD uh, uh, radiation. Okay. Then, uh, there is, of course, the possibility that, along with your main interaction, uh, what remains in the protons, the other partons, they might also do some sort of underlying events. They, they, might, they might have some secondary multiple interactions. You need to simulate those along with their uh, initial and final state radiation. Uh, then you have to remember that all of the objects here, uh, as long as they are charged, uh, QCD charged objects, so they are, if they are hard, uh, uh, if, you, if they are part quarks or gluons, etc., all of these things are color connected to each other. So you need to simulate that, okay? And after that color connection, you have to, you can do this uh, through different models like string model or cluster model, etc. Those, for instance, strings are going to fragment uh, and give you hadrons, and those hadrons are going to decay to further hadrons, and at the end you will get uh, all kinds of particles coming out of from the center of your detector, okay? So, so all of these steps you need to do to simulate one LHC event. Luckily, uh, you, we don't need to do these all by hand, okay? 
uh, essentially there are two major steps we usually take. One of them uh, is this uh, matrix element level, uh, the, 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 the first second step where you give the Python distribution functions and the calculated uh, matrix element uh, calculated to the matrix element calculation. Uh, so the, the first part is this, and the rest of all the steps are done with one piece of software. Okay. So here, uh, these uh, you need these mat different matrix element uh, calculators, different mat matrix element simulators, because you have many many processes in in the LHC. So so here, uh, this hard scattered part is essentially uh, well, it can be SUSE, it can be uh, new quarks, uh, new interactions, E6, whatever physics model you have. But the rest of these guys are essentially the same, uh, essentially standard model physics. So um, uh, here you can have some generic Monte Carlo calculate, uh, matrix element calculators that can compute any two to n process uh, at the three level. For instance, this compact, calcate, mod graph, etc. Or you have some, you can have some specialized, very fast things which can do uh, either uh, fast three level or uh, beyond the three level, next to leading order calculations. Uh, uh, some examples are given here. So you do this first step with those <coughs> guys, and the rest. You do um, uh, through well, some generic uh, guys. Uh, the, the biggest, of course, in our field are Pt and Herbie, Okay, These guys do all the rest for you. Okay? Um, of course, uh, uh, in, a, in a talk like this, I cannot even describe one of these guys. Okay? Uh, because these do all those multiple steps that I uh, explained. And each of those steps have different parameters and different assumptions underlying. So as soon as you start doing uh, real physics, then you will need to calculate systematic errors on your Monte Carlo. Then you will have to learn what the underlying assumptions are for a particular thing that you are looking at. So you will have to do a lot more work on top of this. Okay? And occasionally you will find out that uh, the treatment in PT and verdict is not good enough for what you do. And then you have to add in package packages in and out to replace certain functionality in PT and verdict. Uh, finally, uh, the names and the variety of the functions that the, all these guys do uh, can be quite confusing. Uh, uh, so, uh, for instance, there is this FGAN, uh, event generator, uh, but it is actually responsible for the decays of B hadron. So it is actually something that you plug into a larger event generator. Um, for, the, for the matrix element calculators, the, the real beef where you take the physics uh, like your, your, let's say your Lagrangian and put pros, produce your own processes that will be covered extensively in Gökhan's talk tomorrow. I'll just say a few words about this big guy here. Uh, so as I said, it does this. Uh, well, it can do certain matrix element calculations. It, it does all this initial state relation, final state relation, multiple interactions, hydrogen fragmentation, etc., etc. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so you have to be careful though, whenever you need to enter new processes, I explained before, you will probably need to go to a, a matrix, the real matrix element calculator for the particular process you're interested in. And um, one thing when you do this, uh, you will have to be, uh, one, one, one tip uh, is that you have to be careful with that you do parton shower matching. Uh, this means, uh, since PTA is going to do this initial and final state radiation, it is essentially going to add new gluons and new parts into your uh, into, your, into your event, right? And uh, you have to make sure that those um, don't make you double count, okay? So if you are, for instance, interested in um, some interaction happening, a new particle and three jets coming out, okay? Uh, your matrix element generator is going to give you one new particle plus three quarks or gluons, okay? PTA is going to add more quarks and gluons. Uh, if the, uh, the guys that are added by PTA are very close to the three guys that were in your matrix element calculation, uh, you might end up doing uh, double counting. Okay? So this is, uh, uh, I don't know, perhaps Gretan is also going to cover a bit about what you have to do here. Okay, so by the way, uh, here are the processes that are available in PTA, so it is not so bad on its own either. But okay, so, so uh, this is our first step. We, we generated an event, okay? So you remember what was the next step? Is that we take this event and pass all the final state particles in this event through our detector simulation. And uh, this means, well, you first need to define the geometry of your system, right? Uh, yes. 
cross-section information is real or is it also uh, random? Uh, well, everything that comes from Monte Carlo generators has a, a statistical in, error. In Vitia, I think there is some information, right? Yes. You, you need to calculate matrix elements. So, so let's say I run Vitia and it gives out at the end what the cross sections are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those cross sections that you get are, um, uh, well, are, are, yes, they have statistical error on them. For instance, if you generated uh, 10,000 events of one type with Vitia, okay. Uh, and you generated uh, instead 100 events of the same type, okay? Um, in, the, in the first case, you have um, square root of 100, about 10 times smaller error on the cross-section estimate that you get. Okay. So anyway, all of these things are Monte Carlo techniques. There is nothing which, can, which is exact, okay? Uh, unless you take a pencil and uh, a paper and calculate your own cross-sections, uh, all these guys are going to give you just estimates. But how does it propagate that cross sections? Uh, propagate what? Uh, how, I mean, no, how does it compute the cross sections? How does it simulate the cross sections? Because oh. it wasn't part of your this procedure. Uh, well, um, I, I I am not sure if I can give a solid answer to this because I am, I don't know it for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I remember is that um, whenever, well, whenever you generate events, of course you need to discard certain mm -hmm. events. You cannot like keep all the events. Uh, you, you, you generate many random numbers. Okay, so think of this case. Let's say you have a, uh, let's say you want to compute uh, what pi is, okay? What the value of, numerical value for the pi is, okay? Uh, you, can, you can draw a, a, a square and draw a small uh, a quarter circle inside the square. You can just send in point, uh, you, you, you just make random points inside the square, count how many of those, of those fall into the uh, quarter square and how many of those you fall into the full of the square. When you divide the two, you can give an estimate of, um, of pi. Okay. Uh, so, so, but, but, but you, when you, whenever you do this, um, you will discard, well, um, this is not a good example. But I'm trying to say, whenever you do the, the, these Monte Carlo techniques, not all the time you keep all the all the all the values that you start with. Some some random numbers that you generate, you just discard because they don't really fit in on, on what you want to do. So what PTA is doing, it is generating many many uh, well, uh, scenarios with different phase space, okay? And then uh, from from what comes out from all these different phase spaces, it computes for you uh, the likelihood of an event happening, okay? And then for, from those events that pass your criteria, it adds the weights, and then from there it tells you, so this is the likelihood of the total likelihood <coughs> of all these events happening in the scenario that described, which can be multiplied by a factor to get the cross-section. So does that make sense? No, well, I was wondering like, if, if it has like, preset par parameters for different cross-sections, or...? Um, may I try to give an answer? Uh, yeah. Some? Monte Carlo generators, like the ones that you are going to see tomorrow, can do exact matrix calculations. The idea in those tools is that you match your Lagrangian, your model's Lagrangian, with your tool, with your computer program. And that calculates you using the integration techniques that I just explained a moment ago, the cross-section to its best, up to a certain computational error, depending on your uh, statistics. However, things like PTIA have some, some processes, not all processes, some processes pre-calculated and entered into the program with some form of parameterization. What are the parameters? Say <coughs> initial beam parameters, energy parameters, angular parameters, part of distribution functions. And then starting on the pre-calculated kernel, they fall in the parameters that you, as a user, enter, and then do similar integrations in the face-to-face, -face, and then they give you an answer. Okay. The advantage is, because they have already the kernel prepared, they are fast. The disadvantage is, to enter a new process is a major pain in the... Uh, okay, 
So uh, actually, this is a good point if you will not to ask questions so far, because now we are going to move into the technical simulation. So if you have, for instance, event generator related questions, this would be a good point to ask them. OK. So, so uh, what, we, what I was saying is, OK, you need to define the geometry of your system. Where are your silicon detectors? Where is your liquid argon? Where is your uh, lead or what, tungsten or whatever? And of course, in, uh, when you're defining the geometry, you need to define which materials you use. If, if the materials are not known, how, well, you, you need to somehow give uh, the computer a parameterization of how a given particle behaves in a given type of matter. Okay? So then, of course, you need to define your particles of interest, uh, which ones can be absorbed or not considered, which ones are relevant, which ones interact in certain ways with these materials. Okay? Um, you should be able to generate some test events or test particles so that uh, you can you can see um, the behavior of if the behavior that you define in your material is indeed uh, what uh, comes out from from your generator okay, uh, from your simulation. Um, uh, you need to you need to well write all the interactions of the particles with matter and the electromagnetic fields. Uh, you need to model the response of the detectors. You need to model, uh, well, some, well, not model, but somehow make a good record of all the events and tracks. In the in the, in the nice detector simulation, you should also be able to visualize all these steps uh, <coughs> as, for instance, particles move, how, what they exactly did, okay? And uh, and uh, analyze uh, if everything is working properly at the level uh, of detail you like. Okay. So this is what you want to do with detector simulation, all these guys. And there is one. Uh, or essentially standard software for doing this, that's called Jean Ford. It stands for Geometry and Tracking. Um, uh, it was well, initially developed at CERN with Fortran, now it is being written in C++ by a large international collaboration. And um, it is, as I said, the standard in modern high energy physics experiments, including uh, space science experiments or, or ground experiments and things like that. And uh, its penetration to other fields like medical science, etc., is also uh, quite high and it's getting larger. How does it work? Um, first, you define the initial particles and place them within the geometry that you defined. Okay. So you, this can be the particles that come out of your field here, or it can be some sort of generic, uh, what we call a particle gun, something that always shoots electrons in one direction. Okay. And then uh, uh, for these initial uh, part, well, you starting with these initial particles within the defined volume, you move all the particles in small steps. So uh, what, what, what we mean by small step is defined uh, by the cross section of the relevant processes and the dimensions of the, the used materials. Okay. So if you know, for instance, the uh, uh, the mean uh, interaction length of um, I don't know, photons in uh, some sort of crystal is 5 centimeters. You define your step size to be, uh, let's say, 0 0.5 centimeters, so that every uh, every 0 0.5 centimeters you roll, roll a dice and see if it's interacted or not. Okay. Uh, anyway, so uh, we, we, we do this iteratively as as long as there are particles staying in our detect uh, in our detector volume. Okay, so we, we slowly move and track what each particle does. Okay, and uh, once uh, there are no particles left in our predetermined volume, either because they went out of our detector or they were fully absorbed inside some detector component, then this is the part we say, okay, we are done. And uh, as you can imagine, there are many, many, many processes that are implemented in this uh, genre. Uh, here I only give a short list of the electromagnetic uh, interactions uh, uh, for photons, electrons, muons, hadrons, and uh, all kinds of common things which apply to all charged particles. Okay, um, and uh, all the, the and and of course, in addition to all these guys, there are hadronic interactions, there are decay of particles, there are optical processes. All these guys are are put into Jean. Okay, and um, uh, using Jean in a professional manner. Uh, takes uh, quite a bit of practice because you really need to know which of the processes you need to activate for the thing that you are simulating. Okay? In principle, you can activate, oh, okay, I'm going to put all the processes in just to make sure what to see, well, no, nothing I, I lose. But this causes you to lose significant computational time. Okay? So as a physicist, you will have to pick which processes are most relevant 
to your energy range and uh, and uh, activate those when you run general. Okay. Uh, the, the, the full list of these guys are, are given here. And uh, when you when, if you ask me how I'm going to know uh, which energies are relevant to which particles, etc., uh, that is a very good question. What is the uh, relevant energy scale? The answer is please read the passage of particles through matter in the particle physics booklet. Okay. Actually, I uh, while you are at it, I strongly recommend to read the, the reading rest of the reviews in the particle data booklet as well. It makes great bedtime reading. Okay. And uh, so, so here, for instance, how muons behave, how, how they lose energy, and uh, uh, how electrons uh, lose energy in various media. Right? So you mean the small booklets? Well, the small booklet itself is, is quite good because you can carry it everywhere and you can really easily read it on your uh, on the side of your bed. Okay. And uh, the most uh, most of the reviews are indeed uh, in quite detail in the booklet as well. The, the small one. Okay, so um, what happens after that? Okay, so you, you detect, you, you, you did the, the simulation of your detector. The next step, now you know the response of your detector, you know these signals are coming out, you need to digitize your those signals. So uh, this is usually done with some sort of um, uh, specialized software that you write that uh, takes into account um, the, the pieces of equipment that digitizes your signal. So for instance, if you, if you have uh, photons coming out of a scintillator, to, to, make, to digitize them, you take, let's say, a, a, a photon multiplier tube, and then uh, you get an electrical charge, and then you put a, a ADC to, to, to turn it into some digital count. Okay? So, so uh, all these guys, of course, uh, you can you, you, you can characterize the behavior of your PMT and your uh, ADC, whatever, and then you can write a piece of software that comes after Jean and takes those photons and converts them into uh, fake electrical signals or well, to, to essentially digitize them, okay? So, um, okay, um, you have to be careful while doing these things because each each detect, well, each component that you put in, of course, has its own uh, pieces that you need to understand. For instance, well, if you have dark currents or some certain quantum efficiency or I mean, various properties of the components that you put in, you need to uh, write that software which does the simulation uh, for you properly. Okay? And then finally, now you have digitized data. This will be equally in the same format as the data that comes from your, well, uh, from Atlas, let's say. Then you can run Atlas event reconstruction software on top of it. Okay. So all this might sound quite intimidating to you. And if you want to do certain, lots of, let's say, feasibility studies to, to find out what happens uh, if I come up with some new particle X and it decays in a certain way and I want to find out if LHC can discover them or what plus CMS, whatever, if they want to discover them, if, can, I, can I do it? So, so for those th things, uh, uh, you, you can do a quick, you can go into this quick and dirty way. The quick and dirty way uh, covers everything between the end of event generation and your analysis. So, so the, this quick and dirty way takes out stuff at the end of your event generation, and then converts them to stuff that seems like um, reconstructed electron, reconstructed photon, reconstructed jets, etc. Okay. So you just use like distributions in there? Yes. Uh, so making you exactly. So instead of this, you take what the, what the parameterization of the, let's say, electron reconstruction resolution uh, of CMS. Okay. So then you go to what Pythia gives out, okay, you take electron, if you find an electron in Pythia, you take this parameterization of the behavior of the whole of this uh, CMS uh, behavior in two industry construction software, and then uh, say, ah, okay, if there is a true electron at 5 GeV, uh, it will probably appear as 4.95 GeV <coughs> after the detector and everything has been taken into account. Uh, so, of course, this is a, a, a lot faster than going through this uh, full thing. For instance, in Atlas, uh, uh, simulation of a single hadronic TT bar event takes about 20 minutes. A single event where you need about uh, millions of TT bar events to estimate, let's say, your background. Okay? So, so, if you are a, a, a simple guy with two core machine, this is not what you are going to do, this is what you are going to do. Okay? 
Um, the most common software for doing this is called PGS4. It stands for Pretty Good Simulator. Uh, it's been around uh, for quite some time now, so it went through various revisions, so it is relatively safe and stable code. Okay? And it was initially written for Tavatron uh, detectors, CDF and D0, but now it has some parameters that, uh, that simulate uh, Atlas and CMS. Okay? In principle, we can change, I'll show you, there's a parameter card uh, that defines the detector, how the detector behaves. And then you can do this for a generic uh, cylindrical uh, detector of any kind. Okay? And um, you can download it uh, from its website. And uh, you have to be careful. If you search on Google for PGS, you are going to get the old version, PGS3. So search for PGS4. Uh, the source code is very simple. It is, uh, it is written in Fortran, uh, compilable with uh, both old and new compilers. It has very simple, well, only a simple dependence, which is SPD head. Uh, it has a kernel library, which, ca which keeps on all the functionality of PGS in one single file, okay, in, in individual functions. And then there is a driver code, which calls the individual library functions one by one uh, to, to, to simulate various things. So for electrons, it calls certain functions in an order. For neurons, it calls certain functions, etc. And then uh, you, it, give, it takes in PTR input as the, in the SPG head format, this is like a common standard head format, and then it comes out um, uh, in another text file called an LH0 format, the objects that you would see in your detector. <coughs> okay. So in short, you generate event with PTI, hurry, whatever, or, or some Monte Carlo generator. The particles are written in this SPG head common format. PGS takes uh, these and applies cuts on detector acceptance, uh, makes random choices on detector efficiency, uh, smears the, the, the objects uh, to account for momentum energy resolution, and then uh, reconstruct uh, various objects like, like jets. Okay? And then uh, it comes out these events in this LHTO format, which can be converted into a simple root file where you can do your data analysis. Very fast and easy. Uh, how does it work? Uh, well, process all final state particles um, if they are within the acceptance that you define for your detector. And then uh, if you have a charged particle, uh, put a straight track, not even bending track, put a straight track from the center of the, the detector to the, to, the, to the end of the tracking system. Okay? And uh, hit, uh, well, uh, no, just hit where the calorimeter would be. Okay? Um, to, to, for the energy measurement. And uh, for, for, uh, for photons uh, and neutral particles, it also does the same thing. And then all these guys uh, take a very simplified version of a calorimeter, which is that uh, instead of taking uh, all these different cells and like different layers, just assume there is one calorimeter and one electrometric calorimeter, which is segmented exactly the same way, divided into squares in the eta pi strays. Okay, take your particle, see which cell it is, and assume all of the energy of the particle is deposited on that single cell, and uh, there is no leaks, not whatever at all. Okay, and uh, and then uh, do just small smearings of uh, the objects uh, of the energies when they hit the cell. You just say, okay, a little bit uh, change the energies uh, by a random amount so that uh, you account for the losses in energy or some extra gains from noise, etc. Okay. Uh, and uh, the, the, these uh, random things are uh, well, are modeled uh, through the parameterization of the detectors uh, with these formulas. What exactly these formulas mean? <coughs> uh, there is a statistical part and a, and a constant part. Uh, anyway, uh, if you want to understand what these formulas, what these parameterization means, again, please read your PDG. Okay. So um, essentially, take every guy and uh, propagate them to a calorimeter, assume they drop all their energy into these very simple cells, and then do something which is essential, is reconstruct jets. Okay? So, uh, well, here is a hypothetical uh, collision event. Okay? 
uh, he, of course, you have heard already that QCD uh, says no double signals, no free quarks. Okay, that means everything has to hadronize, everything has to turn into some meson or baryon or whatever, which all decay themselves. Okay, so so if, even if you start with a single, uh, let's say quark or a single gluon, at the end in your detector you get multiple particles. Okay, and uh, uh, all these shower of particles you call a jet. Okay. In, in, in an idealized scenario, for each parton that comes out from your heart <coughs> scattering, you just get one exact uh, jet. Well, that's of course uh, in real life, <coughs> that's not the case. But uh, anyway, so, so, so whenever you see particles that are confined into a small space in your detector, uh, which means they have small relative momentum with respect to each other, uh, but uh, large uh, transverse momentum with, with, with respect to, the, let's say, the beam direction, okay? That those guys, you, you put them together and call it a jet, okay? And uh, there are different methods of jet reconstruction. Um, uh, there are cone-based algorithms where you find one large energy deposition and look around the cone to see what is there. Or, or there are pairwise combination algorithms where you take all guys in the detector, all particles in the detector, or all energy clusters in your hadrometer, uh, and then uh, see if they are uh, by some parameter close enough to each other. Okay, this is defined by the relative momentum with respect to each other. And if that is below a certain value, you say, okay, these two guys probably came from the same source, and you merge them, and you do this repetitively until every guy is merged into into clusters. Okay. So that is another kind of jet reconstruction algorithm. And uh, uh, PGS does these things for you, okay? It has two options, either a very simple cone or a, or a simple KT algorithm. Uh, but uh, at the end, uh, it will uh, provide you uh, uh, the jet objects that you can reconstruct your events in your analysis. And it also does uh, flavor tagging. So whenever you have a, a jet that has originated from a C or a B quark, it's an important thing. For instance, if you want to reconstruct TT by events, you need to find a W and a B quark, B quark originated jet, right? A quark that originated with a B quark. Okay. So, so this is an important <coughs> thing to do, and uh, PGS also does this uh, for you with, a, with an old parameterization of the CDF performance. Um, I, 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 I have a disclaimer here that uh, this, this uh, parameterization is, is quite pessimistic for, uh, for Atlas and CMS. Uh, anyway, so, so it does, uh, it, it also puts a flag for each jet whether it is tagged as a B or a C jet, okay? And at the end, um, it dumps out a list of objects you, recon you make your reconstruction, final analysis from. Electrons, muons, missing energy in the detector, uh, jets, uh, and that's uh, pretty much all about it, okay? Uh, so uh, all these things are somewhat tunable, okay? This is done with a PGS input card. Uh, here is the, for instance, the Atlas card that comes uh, by default with MagGraph, okay? And um, uh, it, it tells all these uh, various ways, what, what parameters to use in all these smearings and uh, what sort of uh, cell size you need to assume for your detector uh, color meter. Of course, there are also hidden parameters in these programs uh, uh, beyond those that you think you can modify. Actually, if you look into the code, you can you see there are other things that are hidden and you can still modify them. So, for instance, uh, there is a there is a hidden muon trigger efficiency which is 98%. I don't know why this is such. It is just a hard coded value which doesn't make so much sense really. And uh, there are other few things um, uh, like uh, the lepton trigger thresholds. And there are occasional things where the same sort of variable is it has uh, uh, two different cuts in two different places. Okay, so so um, knowing what this does, this PGS does for you, you really need to practice a bit. Okay, uh, it is it is very easy to start with. Your results, even if you don't understand these things, though, your results are probably pretty good. Okay, uh, but uh, as soon as you do this for more serious things. Uh, more serious feasibility studies, then you realize there are certain uh, problems. Uh, now I'll quickly talk about this LHO format, the output format that comes out. Okay, uh, I don't want to spend too much time here, but uh, from the slides you'll be able to, to read what this means. 
so, so PGS leaves out this pure ASCII type output file, okay? And uh, the, the format is very simple. Uh, e each line, uh, it, about it, each event with starts with uh, row number zero, which is the uh, uh, which is the event number here, let's say the 39th event that was generated by PTF, okay? And uh, it has an, uh, a trigger word which is 1043, which can be decoded to have at least uh, one muon, one electron above certain momentum. I very rarely use the trigger in this program. Um, then, uh, one by one, you see the output physics objects from you, which you are going to do your analysis. So if the type of the object is zero, that means it's a photon. Uh, its energy is uh, 26 uh, GeV, and uh, you see it's uh, further rapidity and, and uh, phi. Uh, if the type is equal to one, uh, that means it is an electron, and uh, the, the charge is given here uh, positive um, under this Antrac uh, variable, <coughs> and um, it is a, a positron of uh, momentum 164 GeV. Here, uh, if type is 2, it's a muon, uh, its charge is minus, so it's a negative muon uh, with, uh, with some energy deposit around it. Uh, and uh, type 4 means it's a jet, okay? Um, for, for, uh, this, is, this is interesting because it's a V type variable is 2 for it, so this is a, this is a, a jet that was identified as a B jet by PGS, okay? And um, uh, its um, its mass is whatever. Uh, it's a it's a very heavy jet with uh, 85 GeV mass. There are three more other jets, again type four, uh, with different parameters. And finally, type six is used for missing uh, momentum in your uh, detector. Uh, it's uh, uh, of course it doesn't have an error. It has only a phi and a PT value. Okay, so um, you can take. This as uh, missing it is uh, uh, 28 GeV, 29 GeV in a direction in phi of 3.5, which means in this direction you have minus 27 GeV loss, and in y direction minus 7 GeV loss. Okay. So whenever we are going to give you files, and whenever you most often get files from, let's say, a theorist or some uh, well, some other friend, okay, uh, it, 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 this LHCO format is very common. This is what you might uh, encounter. Whenever we give you a root file, we are going to convert these lines into an n-tuple. Uh, but uh, the, the objects, the, the, the name of the objects in the n-tuple will correspond to the columns here. Okay. okay. Uh, there's a new kit on the block called DAFIS. Uh, it, 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 it patches a, bu a bunch of uh, problems with PGS. Uh, this is uh, uh, very new, and uh, I highly recommend it. It can do separate treatment of barrel end cap and forward uh, color meters. It has a, a, a better modeling of the color to nuclear energy resolution. It properly bends charged particles in the B field. It, it provides you other uh, jet algorithms which are more common these days, for instance, anti-KT or Syscon. Okay. Uh, it, it, it can do various uh, special well, uh, model special techniques nowadays that are becoming popular in Atlas and CMS. It can model zero degree color meters, Roman pots, and uh, it has a smart tower construction model. So it is, it, this is a very powerful software. And it has passed through many uh, tests. Here you see uh, an actual parameterization of the, the CMS performance uh, that is uh, shown in, these, uh, in this gray curve. Okay. This is the energy missing ET resolution as a function of the missing ET. Okay. Uh, the CMS uh, <coughs> prediction is this gray band, and uh, the black dots and the fit to it is what DFS gives you. So it is very, very good. It is essentially, if you run the, the, the CMS, full CMS reconstruction, full CMS giant simulation, this, the, the gray band would be what you would get, and DFS is right in the, on top of it. Okay. There is one catch though. Uh, this guy is very recent, so please be ready to prepare with possible bugs. Okay. Anyway, let's say you are in a scenario where you cannot use PGS or DFS. What happens uh, in that case? Uh, this is, uh, for instance, happens if you are interested in charge missile identification for leptons. If you have some sort of special signal like supersymmetry, it is very common to get 
two or more same sign uh, leptons. Let's say two mu pluses, two, um, three LA e positrons or whatever. Okay? And uh, this is a very clean signal because standard model doesn't produce these things uh, at least at the tree level. Okay? So, so um, you are very interested in, in finding the feasibility of this signal. Okay? You want to see, uh, okay, my signal gives two positively charged muons. Uh, what is my standard model background? You, ju you just run simple uh, uh, event generation and you run, let's say, DALFES, and then you'll get essentially almost zero background. Okay? Uh, why? Because DALFES does not have this, the, 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 the model of charge misidentification in your detector. If there is a positively charged positron that comes out from PTA, it's going to appear as a positively charged positron at the end of at the at the end on your LHCO file. Okay? This is not good because a real detector occasionally measures a, mismeasures the charge. A positively charged electron appears as a as a as a as a positron uh, as a negative. A positron appears as an electron. Okay. So what do you do if you are interested in a model like this, in a signal like this? Then uh, you, it's your, it's on your, your, on your own. But it's not difficult. It's quite easy actually. So what you need to do is you need to go to published performance of the detector you are interested in. Okay. Find the part in that publication that is relevant to you. Let's say find a plot that shows charge misidentification as a function of momentum or solubility of the lepton. Okay. Uh, uh, this is going to be some sort of plot with lots of bins in it. Okay. Either read each of the bins or do a very simple fit to the bins uh, as a uh, well, a, a very conservative fit a line to it, fit a, fit a quad, uh, well, polynomial to it or something like that. Okay. And then as you look through the generated events, generated Monte Carlo events, roll a random number and uh, based on that random number decide whether you want to flip. Uh, the, the sign of the, 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 the left on that, okay? Uh, and then you will this way have an estimate of what the, 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 the background would be, okay? So here is the example for this, okay? So I want to do this three lepton, three same sign lepton study. Uh, I want to find how, how much background I'll get in standard model, okay? So what I do is I go to Atlas's um, CERN open blah blah book, okay? And in this book, uh, there is a there is a parameterization of uh, charge misidentification, okay, as a function of the PT of the uh, muon. Uh, I, I I do a very simple line fit to this, and that line fit, uh, since this is a logarithmic scale, comes up to be a function like this as a function of the momentum of the uh, muon. Uh, the, the the chances of having a mismeasurement of the charge is uh, 10 to the power something, okay. So now I have this parameterization of the detected performance. So every time I generate a standard model event which has three leptons and a neutrino, uh, for each of the leptons, I, I roll a random number distributed uniformly between zero and one. If that random number is smaller than this charge rate, I just flip the charge of the particle. Okay, so very easy. And uh, by the way, these PGS, DELFES, etc., they were developed this way. Initially, people were doing little thing, things like this, and then eventually they realized everybody was doing parameterization of one part of the detector, so they just simply put all these guys under one package so that you have an overall class simulation. Okay? So that actually finishes up the um, detector simulation that I want to tell about. Uh, if you have any questions with respect to detector simulation, this would be a good time to ask them. Yes? Can we get the detector's noise from a uh, jump or...? Uh, that, that's a very good question. It depends on what level you want to simulate things. Okay. So, so in principle, you can take, you can put, let's say, you can model, let's say, even an oscilloscope, okay, with all the pieces of it, mm -hmm. and then you can you can put in electrons into in it, like individual many many electrons. You run it for a very very long time, okay, and then you see uh, what is the um, uh, what is the current that you read at the end at the tips of the oscilloscope. On, on the virtual oscilloscope. So, so in principle, with Jan, you can well, get out the noise of a of a virtual object. But this is extremely costly. I mean, uh, well, if you want to make a measurement of real currents of at the micro, I don't know, microampere level, remember the electron charge is uh, whatever, 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb on, on the order of that, right? So you need to do this simulation for a very very long time with very very many electrons, okay? 
So um, uh, practically, then uh, for the for this example that I gave, I would say the answer is no. You can't get it. Ideally, yes. Practically, no. Okay. For your particular thing that you want to do, you will have to uh, decide uh, whether uh, <coughs> this is practical or not. In most cases, if it is a, a measurement device like a PMT or a, or an ADC or something like that, some some electrical component. It is a lot better to, to, to go and characterize that uh, component in the in, in lab and then just take out the, the model, including the, 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 the noise. Okay? And then add these on top of uh, what you get from John. Um, I mean, th th this, is, uh, th this is the answer. I, I see. <coughs> there was a, so I think there was another question. Are there? No? Uh, in case there are uh, deficiencies in the detector, uh, which uh, real deficiencies. Mm -hmm. uh, in Monte Carlo, uh, are they also simulated? Uh, well, the answer is depending on your experiment and how much you put the deficiencies into the Monte Carlo. So, so for instance, um, let's say you learn that uh, certain silicon, well, we have a big silicon detector, and so certain modules are not working. <coughs> okay? You can go and uh, you can say uh, from the output that comes from the Jean. Uh, I'm not going to digitize the, the the signal that is going to come from these particular modules. Okay. So you can blacklist some, black some regions. Exactly, exactly. You can do things like this. Uh, also, for instance, you, uh, you for most of these experiments do a, a, a repetitive cycle with all these simulations. So, for instance, you first start running it AC, you collect some events, and then you find out, for instance, that uh, the, 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 the material distribution uh, within the detector was not really the same as the way you put it into the geometry. So you do another geometry which fixes for those uh, for those mistakes. Any other detector? <coughs> okay, so actually this brings me to the end of my uh, lecture. If you, there are a lot more things with simulation, of course, which are relevant to our field. Uh, things with respect to um, uh, well, how you do accelerator design, how you compute, uh, let's say. Um, uh, what should come out, what should, what should be put in as input even to the event generator. There are simulators for those. There are various simulators that teaches you like uh, uh, how electromagnetic waves be, behave inside an uh, accelerator structure, etc., etc. In summary, Monte Carlo simulation is an indispensable tool for particle physics. Uh, it allows calculation of acceptances, uh, cut efficiencies, background estimations, cross sections, all these uh, various things. It also enables PhD students who doesn't have any LHC data to, to graduate at some point. Uh, <laughs> it, it is, uh, it is, well, it happens essentially in two steps: uh, generation of an event and the simulation of the detector. Uh, here, Jan 4 is the standard. It is amazingly accurate, but very slow. And uh, to, to, uh, in feasibility studies, one does this fast simulation where you take the output of the event generator and just uh, well, run a parameterization of the full detector. And um, obviously, the key thing here is to know the limits of particular simulation tools that you use. This comes, of course, with some experience as you start using it. Um, and uh, you, uh, it is, it is very useful whenever you start using it, well, any, any other piece of software, this is true, of course. Whenever you start using a, a simula new simulation tool, it is very good practice to do whatever tutorial they give, they give you. You might not need, want to read all these 1,000 page uh, manuals, but at least you should try to, to see what, what they show you in the tutorial. Okay? And um, uh, whenever you find out that the simulation uh, does not really cover what you want to do. It is very easy to write your own uh, basic Monte Carlo. Okay, so that's all, and uh, this is the homework for tonight. So it, it uh, it's very simple. I want you to compute uh, these three definite integrals. Okay, uh, uh, writing a very short program, possibly a root map, or it's up to you. And then um, what I want you is to take the first of these. Okay, and uh, run this computation that you did uh, 1,000 times. Uh, take out the results and put them into a histogram and see what is the standard deviation. So, uh, when you, whatever you did to compute these integrals, you should tell me an estimate of the error that you expect from that computation. Okay, 
And finally, there's a bonus puzzle, and uh, that is uh, on the slide that we discussed the LHCO format, I show you one example event. Uh, I would like you to, to guess what that event is, what is the real LHC signal underlying that event. Okay. That's all. One more question. Uh, do we use GM for, uh, for the data that comes from LHC? Uh, but uh, from from I mean from when you say the data that comes from <coughs> LHC that obviously doesn't come on its own, right? Uh, where is that? Ah. Of course, in real life, the data that comes from the LHC is this point, right? Yes. So LHC runs, gives you collisions, you take the, it passes through the detector, and then you get the result. Yeah, so but to visualize. It. Ah, uh, yes, you can use Jean's uh, visualization facilities to do something like this, but I don't think it is really, uh, I, I don't think what you would get out of this, because your detector at the end is going to give you some digital signals, say, okay, at this at time, <coughs> five, there is an egg cover meter deposit of 5 GeV, okay? Um, Jean cannot know how that 5 GeV was deposited, right? So, so first you need to reconstruct the whole event, to understand where all these guys came from, okay? Yeah. Uh, so you essentially go back and under identify what this event is, and then you can, if you want, uh, use uh, Jean's visualization facilities to show you what happened inside the detector. Okay, but so uh, I don't see the game there. Uh, in the website, we, we see the visualizations of the uh, events. Mm -hmm. uh, how do they get that? Ah, um, you mean? Uh, go, 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 Something like this. Yes. Okay, so this has nothing to do with Jean. It, it takes the, the geometry <coughs> that you define in Jean, or maybe a simplified version of that, okay? And then uh, all the rest is the detector response that you measured and, uh, and reconstructed. So, so let's say this is, our, this is my tracking detector, okay? Here you don't see it, but it is made out of many thin wires that uh, are uh, going inside the, the, the plane of the, the screen, okay? And here there are some silicon detectors, and at the out there is this electromagnetic power meter, mm -hmm. okay? So an interaction happens at the center. The, what the detector sees is these little dots, okay? Uh, various parts of the, the, the detector firing, okay? And uh, you, you just visualize those dots, and then afterwards you do a reconstruction of a track. So you, you connect the dots and make these lines. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, you measure the energy in, the, in, in these uh, calorimeter uh, crystals, mm -hmm. okay? and then you, 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 you let's say, uh, paint um, some bars which is more, uh, uh, proportional to the energy deposited. Okay? And this is what you what you do. That's all. This this all comes from your reconstruction of the event. It has nothing to do with uh, visualization. <coughs> so, uh, what is this program? Oh, uh, there are various programs. I mean, nowadays uh, Atlas and CMS have their own private uh, event displays. Okay, these are called event displays in general. I mean, um, At Atlas has something called At Atlantis. If you are interested in a generic event display. Uh, DALFES uh, has, a, has, a, has a program, I think, called FRO, uh, that can read out these DALFES output files and make an, well, a crude event display like this. Or uh, you can use some software, Java software called WIRED, which is, again, a, a, a generic event display where you can uh, define the detector geometry and uh, look at the events. Okay? Um, um, other questions? Okay, so uh, then we are done. Uh, thank you. Thank you.